Will filling your offset smoker cooking chamber with water increase the juiciness and quality of your briskets? I'm testing it out in this video by cooking two briskets, one in an offset smoker and one in an offset smoker filled with water. Will it make a difference? We're gonna find out in this video, so let's get smoking. All right guys, starting with a 12 to 15 pound packer brisket, what I'm doing is I am looking at the vac seal bag and looking where the flat end of the brisket here ends. And right there is where I wanna make this incision. I'm gonna cut some of the flat off anyway in a kind of semicircle because it's much too thin to survive the long cook. So I'm just going to make a cut right here and kind of turn it as I'm going. And then if everything goes well, this chunk along with the piece of plastic comes right off and the plastic goes in the garbage and you can see the trimming for whatever you want. Personally, I tell people that I grind it up and use it for sausage and hamburger and stuff like that. But really what I do is I grind it all up and I just give it away. I have friends and family who I am their sole source of ground beef for the rest of the year because of that, just because I do so many briskets per year and sausage takes a long time to do. So I'm removing this brisket from the cryovac bag in one fell swoop. Sometimes there is a lot of moisture that comes out of the bag. Sometimes there is just a little bit of moisture. This is not blood, contrary to popular belief. This is just juices that are coming out of the brisket mixed with some myoglobin and some of the uh, other stuff that's in the brisket. It's not blood. Now I'm taking a look at what we call the mohawk or the flap. Most briskets have them, but some butchers trim them right off. So we're gonna bring our knife in here and just trim that right off. And then we're gonna take a look at the seam fat here. This is the hard seam fat that goes on the thicker end of the point all the way through the brisket to the other side. It thins out over here and it's really thick over here. And depending on how thick it is, it kind of determines how much we wanna trim back. So what I'm gonna do here, because this isn't a really thick seam, is just get rid of some of the seam fat and I might come in and just take more of that hump away as I kind of trim it down to make the brisket more aerodynamic. I'll trim some of this flat away so I can see the seam fat better. And it looks like it's not too bad. Usually I have really big deposits of seam fat, but this is not bad at all. So I'm gonna come down there and try to carve away as little of the actual meat as possible, but still get it that seam fat that no one is gonna eat. Okay, now I'm coming up against this little point here that's preventing the brisket from being aerodynamic. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna start here and I'm gonna carve some of that off so that it's a little bit more streamlined. And now as we carve into the seam fat, you can see we're exposing a lot of the flat underneath it. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna trim more of that flat away. And then I'll give this mohawk a little bit more of a trim come in down here. And now you can kind of see that we're getting the shape of our future slices. What I'll do when I finish cooking this brisket is cut it right about here. And then we'll have our point where we'll take our slices like this. So our slices will be the point muscle up here with the flat underneath. This fat, this seam fat will render down a little bit, but if it's too thick, then people don't want to eat it. So that's why we want to get rid of as much seam fat as possible. And that's why when we expose more of that seam fat, we're getting down to the flat here. We wanna make a straight cut like this, even though we're sacrificing some of the flat meat. What it means when the brisket is done is that we can carve off our burnt ends here and then start taking our slices right away. There's no kind of jutting out flat portion. So that's actually pretty good on this side. I'm happy with that. Sometimes I'll take more of the point down, but I wanna preserve some of that good meat. And then I'm just looking at this side here and taking down this fat on top of the flat on the left side of the flat until it's about a quarter inch thick. And then I'm moving over to the main problem area of the flat, moving up to the point here, which is where we're gonna take most of our fat cap fat off and trim the brisket down to about a quarter inch thickness. It should be around a quarter inch, three eighths of an inch, even half an inch is okay. In Texas, when I went to Austin last year, I saw brisket fat caps that were anywhere from like less than a quarter inch, like an eighth of an inch, all the way up to half an inch, maybe a little bit less than half an inch. So 
even top barbecue restaurants aren't paying too much attention to getting that perfect quarter inch. So you don't have to worry about it too much. The main thing is it's probably better to leave a little bit more on the fat cap than to scalp it and expose the meat below. Because when you scalp it, then you let more juices bubble out and evaporate and you lose more moisture and you just don't have a seamless covering of that rendered fat that makes the slices look really nice and super tasty. So we're going to start taking our fat cap down here. By the way, it helps to have your brisket super cold, like 40 degrees Fahrenheit, refrigerator temperature. And then I'll come around here and just take some of this flat off all the way into the point, just so I can expose the meat a little bit more. Take a look at what we're dealing with. So you can see that we're dealing with a really thick fat cap. So I'm gonna be quite aggressive at trimming that off. Still pretty thick, so I'm gonna keep going. I'm actually gonna take some more off of here because what happens usually is the, the thick end of the fat cap curls down over the flat on this side, so it's helpful to carve a lot of it away. All right, I'm happy with that fat cap thickness now, so I'm just going to round off the corners here just to help the brisket cook a little bit more evenly. This is kind of a judgment call. You can see how thin this is compared to this end. So sometimes, and I might do it right now actually, I might just take the brisket further back like this just because that thin end is so thin that I know that it's just gonna dry up during the cook. So I just kind of trim it off and I might round that off a little bit more. Okay, I'm done with the top of the brisket. Now I'm gonna go to the bottom. And the first thing I'm gonna deal with is this hard deposit of fat right here. All I do is I tuck my blade underneath the fat like this, and then I just push up and out and I remove the whole thing like that. This overhang right here of the point is where our burnt ends are gonna come from. So that's good, but sometimes there's some really super hard fat on the edge here. So we just wanna make sure we're carving that off because it's no bueno does not taste good. And here, unfortunately, you can see how the butcher kind of sliced into the flat here. So that is not a good thing. That's not gonna hold up during the cook. It's gonna create weird slices. So unfortunately, I have to kind of dig in and cut this flap out. But sometimes you just get what you get. Sometimes you get a brisket with a huge deposit of seam fat that is, that is massive right here and it's separating the whole brisket and you can't really do anything about it. That's one thing that you can get unlucky about or gouges in the fat cap, or in this case, in the flat. You can't do much about that because you can't really identify it a lot of times when you buy it from the butcher. So you just have to look at the cryovac bag, try to pick out the best brisket you can that looks as pristine as possible and leave the rest to Jesus. Now, the last thing I'm doing is I'm removing the silver skin. A lot of this silver skin here, it uh, creates a uh, effect when you heat the brisket up that kind of curls the brisket. So if you have a lot of silver skin on the bottom of the brisket still, it'll curl up the brisket and it doesn't really cook the same way the rest of the meat and the fat and the collagen does. It's also hard for the smoke and the salt to penetrate through it. So you just want to remove as much as possible, but it will be kind of unnoticeable even if there's a couple patches left. So don't worry about getting all of it. And then I'm just going to make a few judgment calls here. Like I'll trim this off because I'd carve a lot of the, the flat off here. So I'll probably take a little bit there just so it sits a bit flatter in the smoker. And I might take a little bit more of this seam fat out, but otherwise it's looking pretty good. The only other thing I'd probably do is sometimes I like to pound the point flat just to get a better look at it. And in this case, it's got some weirdness. It's got this little hanger on piece there. So I'll slice that off. And then this part of the mohawk is kind of jutting out. That's going to get dry during the cook. So I will carve that off and then I'll kind of carve this a little bit just to create more of a rounded point. And there we go. We have a fully trimmed brisket here. So the next step is to apply the rub to it. Now, before applying the rub, I'm just going to give it a quick spritz, starting with the bottom of the brisket. This is just basic water. And then I'm going to be using some Killer Hogs Texas Barbecue Rub by Malcolm Reed pretty good stuff. So I'm just going to start by applying it to the bottom side of the brisket. I'll get the edges here, flip it, do the top. 
And then I'm gonna flip it back over and I'm gonna use a bit of this Oak Ridge Barbecue Signature Edition Black Ops Brisket Rub. This is going to be my final layer. Usually I put a final layer of Lowry's, but sometimes I have some extra rub kicking around from a competition team or a smaller uh, barbecue rub vendor. So I like to use it and I'll just start applying that to the bottom. Just adds a little bit of extra depth of flavor. Get the edges. Flip that around and finally going to clean this up with a little bit more Texas barbecue rub and a little bit of the black ops. Now I'm going to repeat that process with the other brisket. I'm going to cover it with cellophane and I'm going to leave it in the fridge overnight to soak up that rub. Just gonna chop up some splits of wood, pretty small, maybe half this size, and then I'll stack them up in the Oklahoma Joe's. All right, guys, I'm at the firebox of my Highland over here. I've got my Longhorn over on the other side of the yard that I've already lit, but I just wanted to show you guys how I light my offset smokers. I just kind of chunk up some splits, whatever size they come in in the actual logs is fine for the um, initial preheat part of the cook, the startup of the firebox. I just chuck them in in kind of a crosswise fashion. And then I take my Oklahoma Joe's charcoal starter and I'll light this guy up. There we go. And we'll just give this a light. And now that the fire is initially lit, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take some of these splits and I'm going to cut them in half with my alligator loppers. This is the safest way that I've found to cut down splits to size. Don't use a miter saw or a chop saw. Eventually you're gonna have a near miss like I did multiple times. This is the best tool for the job. Okay, moving over to the Longhorn where I'll be doing the experiment with the water at the bottom of the cook chamber. I just bought a basic flask stopper from Amazon. It's a number three. If you can find them on Amazon, they're for closing like those Bunsen burner flask things. And I'm just going to plug it into the hole here, give it a twist so it's sealed. And now I'm going to add my water. It's gonna take me a couple trips to the kitchen probably. Now I thought about cleaning the Oklahoma Joe's here before I did this test but I decided against it because I wanted to see if this actually cleaned out the bottom of the cook chamber as a beneficial result of adding the water to the bottom. So we'll see what happens. All right, that's about as full as I want it to be without the water actually draining into the firebox and dousing the fire. So I'm gonna put the brisket on the smoker now at an angle, point towards the fire. I've also got another water pan here that I'm gonna use because I normally use them because they absorb the radiant heat coming from the fire and they result in more even temperatures across the cooking chamber. So I'm gonna use one in here, which I'm gonna fill, and I'm gonna also use one in the other smoker, the Oklahoma Joe's Highland as well. Okay, so back over to the Highland. I'm gonna fill this water pan up with water, should be enough. Now our brisket goes on right there, and we're gonna shut this guy up. All right, guys, we're over here at the Longhorn Offset Smoker. This brisket has been cooking for about four, four and a half hours now. This is the smoker with all the water in the bottom, so we're gonna take a look at it and see how it's looking. That's looking pretty nice, actually. Okay, so it's got some good bark formation on the, the edge of the point here on the flat, the flat is curling up a little bit, so that's not a great sign. I might rotate this brisket a little bit to help it cook a little bit more evenly. And I'm gonna spritz the corners here, just so they don't get so dry. And the edges, maybe a little bit there. But otherwise, the brisket is looking like it is progressing pretty well. Looks like it has a nice red mahogany color. Let's see what the internal temperature is here. I'm gonna get my Oklahoma Joe's probe thermometer out. And we'll go in over here. So we got mm, 140 in the point. We got 147 in the flat. What do we have? 150. So actually this brisket is cooking pretty evenly. So that's a good sign. 160 over here on the edge. So looking pretty good so far. I'm gonna shut this up and we're gonna go look at the other one. <clears throat> okay, taking a look at the control brisket. Woo, looking pretty nice. Pretty similar to the other one. It's got some nice well-developed areas over here and there's more bark that's forming on the flat. I'm gonna probe into this guy. So we're getting 150 in the point, 150 in the flat, 149, 150. So this one's cooking pretty evenly too, which is good. It's looking pretty nice. 
There's a bit of pooling here. So what I'm gonna do is I'll grab some paper towel and I'll dab that a little bit. And I might come in and just spritz these edges a little bit just to help them not dry out so quickly. And we'll give this a little bit of a dab. Just get rid of all that extra moisture there. I could dump it and it will drain off or I could put a lock under it to let the juices drain off. But this is the most effective way to get all that excess moisture off because it soaks it all up. And it's not just water, it's rendering fat and collagen that's converting to gelatin. It's all getting pushed to the surface. So sometimes it likes to stick to the brisket. So I'm gonna do that every maybe 15 minutes or so. Make sure I've got some more moisture here. We'll let this guy keep on cooking until we get to 190 internal. All right, we are 13 hours in. Let's take a look at the control brisket here. Whew, very nice. I like, that looks really, really good. Probing at 187-ish, 194, 185. So we're hovering around 190, I'm pretty happy with that. So I'm gonna pull this off and I'm also going to wait for the other brisket on the Longhorn that has the water in it to get to 190, then I'll pull it and then we will wrap it. Okay, so we have the control brisket here. It's probing at 190 everywhere throughout the brisket. So I'm going to wrap it in butcher paper first, and I'm gonna lay down some tallow mixed 50-50 with clarified butter. I'll wrap this guy up, starting with this flap over here. And then what I like to do is just come up with this flap, straighten that out, make a seam, Come up with the other flap, make another seam right there. And I flip the entire brisket end over end. And then there's a little bit left that goes underneath so that the weight of the brisket holds down that top flap. And in that way, I get a complete bottom pan if you will, of butcher paper that is completely holding in all of the moisture that's gonna drip out of the brisket, so very little leaks out. The second thing I'm gonna do is wrap it in aluminum foil. So one like this. Another one like that. And the brisket goes right in the middle here. This is the way that Goldie's Barbecue, the number one Texas barbecue joint in Texas, wraps their brisket. I learned it from Jerby's Barbecue Channel. And it's a great way to wrap a brisket in foil because what happens when you pull this flap up is it cinches this part of the aluminum foil up into a bottom pan. So if we go like that. And then like that. This piece of foil is cinching up the pan like that. And then we just come in like this. And what I like to do is just very lightly cinch up the corners. Now there we go, we have a completely seamless pan on the bottom that's going to hold all the juices in and everything is completely sealed. So now this is going to go into my sous vide holding chest, which has been set to 150 degrees Fahrenheit, and I'm gonna hold it for 15 to 18 hours overnight. And now I'm going to go out and grab the other brisket, which is on the Longhorn offset smoker that has the water in the bottom of the chamber. I'm gonna wrap it the exact same way, put it in the holding chest, and then we'll do the taste test tomorrow. All right, guys, we got the control brisket here. And we're gonna open it up and see what it looks like. Let's open this bad boy up. Oh, guys, I'm excited about this. Look at that brisket. Ooh, that looks absolutely delicious. All right, guys, let's slice into the control brisket. It is looking really nice. So I'm gonna cut it right down the middle here. And I'll give you guys a nice double decker shot. Ooh, look at that. That is juicy. Now, starting with a piece of the point, I'm gonna turn it this way. I'll do the burnt ends here. I'll cut those up later, and then I'll do a couple slices. This is looking really good, guys. Looking really good. I'll show you just this piece of the end of the point here. Wow, absolutely amazing, super juicy. Pull it apart, pulls apart effortlessly. Let's give it a taste. Perfectly rendered, fatty, salty, amazingly flavorful, perfect brisket. Mmm. And let's try a piece of the flat here. There's the flat, nice and juicy, pulls apart super easily. Is there any tug in the flat? No, zero tug. Let's taste a piece of the flat here. Mmm, 
really good. Perfect flat, not overly dry, pulls apart. Still a little bit beefy, so it's retained its beefy flavor. It's just a perfect brisket, guys. I don't know how the water in the offset smoker brisket is gonna beat this, but we'll see if it can. All right, so this is the moment of truth. Did putting water in the bottom of the cook chamber of the offset smoker make this brisket any better than the last one we just tried? Let's find out. So slicing into it, feels pretty tender. I'll give you guys the double decker shot. Woo! That's looking actually a little bit juicier so far than the last one. Pretty impressed so far. Let's take the point here and we'll do some burnt ends. Put that to the side. And then I'll do a couple slices. Get some tallow on this bad boy just so it doesn't oxidize. And I'll show you guys. It looks really nice. Let's see if it pulls apart. Pulls apart really easily. How does it taste? Really good. Just as good as the other one. Perfectly cooked. Mmm. I could eat that all day. So let's try a piece of the flat here. That was a bit of a thicker slice, actually. <laughs> Little too thick. There we go. That is better. Get some tallow on that. Give you guys a look. So that's a piece of the flat. We'll pull it apart. Pulls apart nicely. And how does it taste? Really good. Comparable to the last one, it tastes almost identical. So time for conclusions. Does putting water in the cook chamber of your offset smoker improve the quality of your brisket? I would say based on this experiment, both briskets were almost identical in terms of quality. I think it has more to do with how you approach the cook rather than how much water is in your offset smoker. For example, I rotated the briskets. I used my judgment to kind of foil off areas that were looking drier. I spritzed dry areas. I controlled the fire when it was getting too hot and too low. So I think it has more to do with the actual skills of the pit master and what you do during the cook than filling the bottom of your smoker with water. I do think that adding a large water pan actually really helped these briskets, and I always use a water pan for that reason. But do you need to go to the extra step of filling the entire bottom of your cooking chamber with water? Based on this experiment, I don't think so. The one thing that I would say that it helped with is temperature control. The offset smoker where it had water in the cooking chamber, it had a lot better temperature control and I didn't have any temperature spikes at all. Whereas the other offset smoker was having temperature spikes that went up to like 350, but the one with all the water in it, it seemed to have much steadier temperatures. So if you're having a lot of issues with maintaining steady temperatures on your offset smoker and you're getting wild temperature swings that are going up really high and you're having trouble sort of maintaining a good fire while still getting a low temperature. And maybe you wanna run a 225 degree or 200 degree fire or something like that for a super low and slow cook. This might be a good method because it helps you with the temperature control. The other thing is it does help with cleanup a little bit. I was able to just drain the entire smoker and all the grease and all the nastiness and creosote that gathered in the bottom was washed away by the water. That being said, I still had to deal with that water, so I don't know if it made it any easier. So guys, I'm gonna enjoy this brisket now with a nice dram of Lagavulin 8-year. I prepared it using my Oklahoma Joe's cocktail smoking box, and I poured myself a smoked dram of scotch. Let's see how it tastes. Ooh, that's smoky. That actually adds a lot of smoke flavor to this. Lagavulin is already known for smokiness, but this takes the smokiness to the next level. It's really, really good. So thanks so much for watching, guys. Let me know in the comment section below whether you'd ever try something like this, putting water in the cooking chamber of your offset, or if you have tried it, let me know in the comments below about your experience. You can catch me in future videos on the Smoke Lab, and if you have any ideas for future videos or experiments you'd like to see, drop them in the comment section below. Make sure you subscribe to the Oklahoma Joe's YouTube channel. Give this video a like. I will see you in the next video, but until then, happy smoking.